Morning everyone, again. <laughs> we'll learn not to do that. Okay, so this is week two in our sermon series on Galatians and we're in the second half of the first chapter and the title is Called by God. Now, uh, as I mentioned last week, Galatians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to several churches that he had planted a few years prior in the region of Galatia. Now, since his last visit, some false preachers came through the region preaching a different gospel. And not only did they preach something that was untrue, but they challenged Paul's apostolic authority in order to undermine what was true. And Paul cut right to the chase uh, in writing this letter, replacing his typical section of thanksgiving with a rebuke. You might remember that. After making it clear that there is no other gospel, Paul explained in this passage how he was called to preach the one true gospel. And why should the Galatians trust Paul's gospel as opposed to the gospel they heard from the Judaizers? Now that may, a new, may be a new word for you, right? Judaizers, that's a word we use to describe the Jewish Christians who tried to add observance of the Jewish law and especially circumcision on top of the gospel that Paul had preached. They tried to put back that dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, right? By saying, okay, you Gentiles, that's good. I'm glad you're saved, but you're not fully saved until you do these extra things on top. All right? And that is why Paul writes this letter in very strong language um, to counter that because they'd lose their salvation if they tried to do it by their own strength. They tried to be please God by doing things like that. Why should we trust Paul's gospel in the first place? Paul shows us that the scripture contains unchangeable doctrinal truth and it also contains an experiential component. In other words, it's not just words on paper, but we experience things as a result of hearing the gospel. And so, the doctrinal nature of Christianity does not allow for radi radical changes or shifts in doctrine. The Bible doesn't change. The Gospel was delivered us according to Jude verse 3, once and for all. Alright? This is the opposite to our postmodern culture, which suggests that we all have our own realities, we all have our own truths, um, my reality is just as valid as your reality and it's judgmental to challenge someone else's truth. Right? That's the way it is in the society and if you ever tried teaching in school recently you'd know exactly what you were up against. Um, on the other hand there is an, essential, an equally essential component to Christianity and that is the experience of Christianity. Paul's testimony shows that truth and experience are united, right? You can't have one without the other, right? You can't get saved without being changed. If transformed lives testify to the truth of the gospel, then the daily process of becoming more like Jesus is critical. Paul doesn't claim perfection in this letter, but he has clearly been changed from the Saul that tried to wipe out the early church. So in our reading, Paul talks about his life before, during and after his conversion. In our reading this morning, he talks about how he was called by God to be an apostle and where he received his teaching. He says, but I made known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from a man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? No one taught me this. 
Jesus taught me this. You might remember that Paul opened the letter with an argument for the divine origins of his apostleship. Very first sentence. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now we go back to verses 11 and 12. Right. Here in verses 11 and 12, Paul argues for the divine origins of his message. His primary claim is that his gospel came directly from Jesus. Paul said that he did not receive the gospel from any man, rather that the gospel came to him in the person of Jesus Christ. Our God reveals himself. Right? He reveals himself to us. At some point, all of us, have, God has revealed himself to all of us. And that revelation was so profound that we found ourselves accepting and receiving Jesus and getting saved. Amen? <clears throat> so, how does he do this now? Well, the book of Hebrews says it this way. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his Son. God used to speak through prophets, but now he speaks through his Son. And his Son spoke to the apostles who recorded his word for us in the New Testament. And his Son speaks to us today through the Scriptures, through the preaching, scarily enough, right? through the reading of the Scriptures and the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of believers. Now, Paul's conversion story was pretty spectacular, wasn't it? There, riding you know, on his road to Damascus, blinding flash of light, knocked to his feet, blinded. Who are you, Lord? Asked and answered him the same question. <laughs> There are several ways in which someone might receive the gospel, but it will always involve the recognition that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for them upon the cross and that he rose again proving he was who he said that he was. And that is the baseline doctrine or belief of Christianity. Right? That's the bottom line. But the gospel doesn't cause us to make a decision and leave us unchanged. The gospel is not something that you accept and then move on with the rest of your life. Thinking, oh, I ticked that box, I'm going to heaven, I'll just go on living my life as normal. The Bible tells us that it has to reform the way that you live and the way that you think. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. Paul wrote in this passage in verses 13 and 14 how he lived before his conversion. Verse 13, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So two things characterised Paul's life before his conversion. One, he persecuted the church. He went from house to house, dragging Christians out and throwing them into prison. He wanted to destroy the church. He wasn't seeking to be saved. He wasn't an inquirer into the truth of the gospel. He wasn't exploring the claims of Jesus. He was attacking it violently and dangerously and relentlessly. If you've ever met someone committed to breaking down your own faith, you know how difficult it is to change their mind. So the, a good takeaway here is this. If Paul could be transformed in an instant, 
anyone can be transformed. Okay? And secondly was his progress as a Jew, his progress as a Jewish scholar and leader of his nation. Right? He was in the Sanhedrin. He was the cream of the crop, this man. One of the brightest thinkers in the whole Jewish universe at that time. He says in Philippians, he gives us his resume. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. It's pretty strong stuff. Paul trusted in those things. He thought he would find acceptance with God through his accomplishments. Paul didn't see his sin. He said he's blameless. As a devout Jew, he knew all about the prophecies of the Messiah. But he assumed it wasn't Jesus. It couldn't be, could it? Instead of sitting on a throne, Jesus hung on a cursed cross. The scripture has that curse in the Old Testament. Cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. And that's how they describe the cross, mm -hmm. as a tree. In other words, there was absolutely nothing in his background, that prepared him to view Christianity favourably. Nothing. Even so, those who receive Christ will change. In various ways and to various degrees, every true believer experienced transformation. Some change is obvious, some change is subtle, but no one remains the same. That's the power of the gospel in the life of a believer. If we are not changing, then perhaps we need to do as Jesus said, <coughs> repent and believe. What does repent mean? It means to change the way that you think about the gospel, to change the way you think about your salvation. Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand, and we don't want any of you to miss it. Amen? Then Paul goes on to describe his calling. Now, in a couple of those verses, I don't know if I've got them here. No. He alludes to Isaiah and Jeremiah. In both of those prophets, they say, the Lord called me from the womb in Isaiah 49. And before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's Jeremiah 1.5. When Paul is saying, the God who separated me from my mother's womb, as he wrote in Galatians, he's saying, I'm a prophet just the same as Isaiah, just the same as Jeremiah. I have the same qualifications. He saw the apostolic ministry as the culmination of the ministry of the prophets. They were the last line of prophets to witness to God's covenant faithfulness. And just like prophets, their preaching calls people to repent and believe. Notice how Paul transitions from speaking of his work to God's work. The gospel is the power of God for salvation, says Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. It affirmed, Paul affirms that God does the work of salvation. He sets us apart. He calls us by his grace. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's not our own doing, lest any of us could boast. He reveals his son to us. God does this work 
from beginning to end. We become believers not because we love God, but because he loved us. That's what John says. At the same time, this doesn't rem remove your responsibility from the equation. Every one of us must receive the gospel. One of the ways you know that you've received it is when you recognise that even your ability to receive the gospel is a gift. It's a gracious gift from God. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It's the gift of God. When we realise that God calls and reveals himself, we understand that no one is beyond the reach of the gospel. For many of us, when the calling of God came, we weren't expecting it. There was a point when you began to see things clearly. And that in itself was a work of God. Even though you might have heard the gospel before, you finally understood it. Job testifies, remember Job? I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. We've considered Paul's life before conversion and we've seen what happened at his conversion. Now let's see how Paul lived after his conversion. Verses 16 to 24. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God I do not lie. Afterwards I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. So remember Paul is trying to show the Galatians that the gospel message he preached to them was not passed down to him by any man. He did not receive the gospel from the apostles making him subordinate to the other apostles. His message came directly from the risen and ascended Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus. His message was not altered in any way. And Paul is showing both his gospel and his apostolic commission were independent of the influence of any person. He went up to Jerusalem where he spent 15 days his, person, his purpose was not to receive the gospel from Cephas or Peter. Fifteen days wouldn't have been enough time. He simply went there to visit him. He wanted to meet him and get to know him. Plus much of his time there was spent preaching according to Acts. And finally Paul went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Through all these years Paul never met the churches of, of, in Judea. Judea. Israel and Judea. Judea today is, we know as the West Bank. Um, the next time Paul visits Jerusalem is 14 years after his conversion. In Acts 8 we don't read about Paul. We read about Saul. Saul. That's the name he was called before his conversion. Saul persecuted the very church that Jesus died to establish. Think about that. He was quite possibly the most prominent persecutor of Christianity after Christ's death and resurrection. And the response from Christ was swift and sure. He destroyed Saul. He destroyed Saul's pride. He destroyed Saul's purpose. He destroyed Saul's mission and ultimately he destroyed Saul's life. 
everything he knew and lived for before his conversion was destroyed. But what he received in its place was beyond compare. After working all of his life to gain an appearance of righteousness above his colleagues, Paul would say that that was rubbish in comparison to the righteousness that comes from Christ. A righteousness that never can be lost. He received everlasting life. He preached a gospel. Jesus Christ won Paul's affections and changed the world. One man changed the world. None of this was deserved. It wasn't at all expected. He was even predisposed to reject it. But what happened? He received it. He left his old life behind as soon as he met the Lord Jesus Christ. God setting him apart, calling him and revealing Christ to him, overcame Paul's natural resistance and it changed the way he saw everything from that point forward. As an accessory to murder and imprisonment of the early Christians, Saul should have been condemned. But he was given life instead. That's grace. Jesus didn't strike him dead on the road to Damascus, did he? He was given life. Saul was bent on destroying the church. But instead God, God made him one of the pillars of the church. I don't know, can you see yourself in this story? Although you probably don't persecute the church like Paul, each one of us needs conversion just as much as he did. And it's an ongoing thing. There are things in our lives that need converting every day, that need to be changed. Do you recognise the work of God in your own life. Well, if you don't, today is your day of salvation. Don't wait another moment. Turn to Christ without hesitation. Your experience won't be exactly like Paul's, but you must know that you're a sinner and you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, just as Paul did. If you have received Christ, then give God the glory for the work that he has done in you. Be grateful. God loves grateful people. Seek to know him more and more as he has revealed to you in your word. In his word, sorry. Add to your faith the elements of a transformed life. It won't always be quick and dramatic, but it must be there. We must be aware of the changes that are taking place in us. None of us has received an apostolic commission like Paul, but all followers of Jesus have been called by him. We have all been commissioned by him. What was the commission? Go make disciples. Go make disciples. Teach people how to follow Jesus. Show people how to follow Jesus. You can do this. Just do what I do. That's what Paul used to say. Do what I do. You'll learn how to be a follower of Jesus. Go and make disciples. Be about the work of the kingdom wherever you are. Amen? Amen. 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 <clears throat>